Well, hello, 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 and happy Saturday afternoon to everyone. I hope you're having a great afternoon and a great weekend so far. Uh, my name is Don Terrell, and uh, I want to welcome you to another great episode of The Color of Motion, where I like to say stories come in all shades. And I highlight people of color and diverse backgrounds in the industry of motion graphics, animation, visual effects, cartoons, and comics. Uh, this space that I love so much. Uh, you can check, we're here every Saturday afternoon, as you know, because it's uh, Saturday afternoon. But uh, we're here every Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. And you can check me out on my LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook page. Uh, but I do always like to highly recommend people go to my YouTube page, subscribe, give me a thumbs up, hit the bell notification so that you are notified of when new episodes go up and great new content goes up as well like i said we got a lot of great new things i'm super super excited to be uh unveiling the new look of the show within the upcoming weeks i've been working hard at it as i've been letting you know so uh just glad to be uh really leveling up the show and so excited for you to be a part of it for sure um, a lot of great new things going on, new intro, new graphics, uh, getting some spot, working on getting sponsors for this show. So just a lot of great new things uh, happening with the show that I'm really excited to share with you. So uh, this this interview has been a long time coming. We've been uh, my next guest. Uh, we've been really I've been working really hard to get him on. We've been going back and forth and finally, finally got a chance to get him on. So I'm super, super excited uh, to be sitting down with him, diving into his story and just uh, chopping it up for a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to dive right into this one here. Uh, my next guest, he's vice president, current series and diversity for Disney Television Animation, TVA. He is responsible for managing the creative direction of production on current series for Disney TVA and working closely with the department or with the development and recruitment teams to identify secure and mentor diverse creative talent for Disney TVA and Disney Junior. He joined Disney TVA in 2007. During his tenure, he has overseen creative direction on a multitude of original animated series, including Disney's five-time Emmy Award-winning Phineas and Ferb. Emmy Award nominated Big City Greens, Amphibia, Pin Zero, Part Time Hero, Randy Cunningham, Ninth Grade Ninja, and most recently the Disney Plus original animated adventure movie, Phineas and Ferb, the movie. Candace Against the Universe. Born in Boston, Massachusetts, he received a Bachelor of Science in Television and Film Production from the Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse. Syracuse. Syracuse University. He is a member of Disney's Leadership Learning Advisory Board, Academy of Television, Arts and Science, and Asifa Hollywood. Please, everybody, uh, help me welcome my very special guest and friend, Mr. Jay Francis. Jay. <laughs> I appreciate you so much for uh, being on the show. Uh, how you doing? Uh, like I said, I appreciate you so much being on, and uh, we're going to dive right into this. Uh, I gave a little bit of your background, but why don't you kind of, uh, you know, fill in a little bit of your background there? Well, sure. Thank, first of all, thank you for having me today. I, um, it's an honor to be here, and um, it's funny because oftentimes I get asked that question 
about my journey and how I got into animation. And um, um, I've been on a few podcasts and panels at this point. So there's a part of me that gets a little bit of like, sort of <laughs> hear myself talk. But, uh, but um, you know, first of all, part of the story, you know, and I'm sure you can appreciate this. We'll, we'll be dating ourselves a little bit, right? Because I'm you know, already the, with the, my the, hair. The, I can't yeah, help, you know, but, you know. <laughs> and, you know, my story starts after graduation at Syracuse, which was 1984, and coming out to L.A., um, just looking for a job in entertainment. I didn't come out here with the idea of like, oh, I want to be a director. I want to be a producer. I want to be a writer. I came out with the, I went to school to get a, in TV and film. So I want to get a job in that business, especially because I got student loans to pay. <laughs> and, um, and there was something unique and intriguing about LA to me. I'd never been to LA before. And um, so there was that whole sense of adventure as well. But you know, I came out here, and now let's let's remind the folks here. Nineteen <laughs> I, summer of nineteen eighty four. So <laughs> let's talk about what there wasn't. There wasn't uh, cell phones. There wasn't an internet to upload your resume to. Um, there was barely cable. You know, I remember when I when I got my first apartment in L.A. It was in. Um, it was in Studio City, for those who are familiar with uh, the, the sort of Southern California area. And uh, if you lived in 1980, so I, I actually got my job in 1985. I came out in 1984. February 1985, if you lived in Studio City and you were um, south of Ventura Boulevard, then your house or apartment was wired for cable. A <laughs> hundred yards further, like if you, it was north, like they hadn't gotten to you yet. So think about that, you know. Um, so there was that. There was this idea what we were still, were we even, we were debating beta versus VHS, right? In terms of what home, yeah. you know. So there was no streaming. There was no internet. There was no cell phones. There was no Uber. There was no Uber Eats, oh, you know. Man came to town with a briefcase full of resumes, a, a, a map, a physical map, and a book of addresses of places that I felt, hey, this might be a good place to drop off a resume to. So um, I remember, um, you know, uh, being, in a, being in Hollywood and taking a bus over to what, as I just sort of referenced, Studio City, and not because I had any sort of secure knowledge of like, oh, you know, this place is over there. It was like Studio City. Well, there must be studios there, right? I mean, why would you call, why would you, you know, I, I grew up in the East Coast. <laughs> Towns were given real names, Studio City. So, but, you know, I naively hopped on that bus. And um, in 1984, summer 1984, if you took that bus from Hollywood over the, what we call the Coanga Pass into, into the San Fernando Valley, the first entertainment company you would have seen at that point was the old Hanna Barbera Studios. Uh, yeah. uh, it, so you know, so I remember as I was sort of um, on the bus, just sort of the, the big Fred Flintstone flags and the Jetsons and Johnny Quest and yeah, Scooby Doo. Yeah, and I'm I like, loved Hanna Barbera. Yeah, right. And I was, and I was, and and that's when it occurred to me, right, that well. I don't know how they make cartoons. I have, you know, I have no thought in terms of whether or not this there's a job there for me. But what I do know is that these these folks have more on television than anyone else. I'm going to be given a resume to, and and so let me remind you of my goal to get a job in the entertainment industry. It wasn't it, you no know, specific uh, position, or I mean, what in no. film. You know, when no, you went to school, what were you training to do in film so, and television? So we were we were given that sort of buffet of do a little bit of everything. So there was an audio class. There was, you know, uh, entertainment law. There was, you know, um, there were sort of t production courses. So we, you know, you would take a stab at being like running a news, a, a fake newscast, you mm -hmm. know. Sometimes you were on camera, sometimes you were on the switcher, you know, so we were getting that very specific live action TV production. 
um, we again, so we referenced sort of the audio class and stuff. So there was sort of you, you would rent out a film camera and, and and do your little film, right? So it was a very sort of broadly broadly skewed um, education you were getting. And, you know, for me, it was, there was nothing that specifically, you know, um, I embraced. And at the same time, I didn't um, dismiss anything out of hand. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the reality of, and, you know, truth be told, this is where we get into, this is the 1984 of it all versus today. You know, I tell students oftentimes, it's like, you have to give me a little bit of help here in order to guide you. Because, you know, if, 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 if you were to say to me what I was saying back then, of like, oh, I just want to get in the entertainment industry, I'd be like, I, you know, what does that mean? You know, right? But this was 1984. And, you know, think about what we considered as the entertainment industry in 1984. Yeah. Yeah. TV and movies, right? I yeah. mean, there was no yeah. game industry. There was no internet. There was yeah. no, you, you know a lot of what we sort of look at as the entertainment industry yeah, either yeah. wasn't sort of in a in a in a place where it was relevant or just didn't exist, yes, right? Yeah, so yeah. I tell um, people now, like I said, it's it's so interesting now the kids that grow up are so used to things that like I said, I remember mailboxes on the corner Oh, you know, no cell phone. Like I said, you had to hope somebody was home when you called them, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, type of thing. Yeah. So. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, for me, it was just like I saw opportunity there. You know, I, I recognized that this was a place that, you know, again, had did TV shows. So maybe there's something in there for me. So got off the bus, walked in, and I've told this story often enough, but there was a, a receptionist there who will never know how she changed the course of my life because she she saw me from a mile away <laughs> wearing a suit thinking I was just going to stroll in and get an interview and, you, you know, I'm going to knock this out, right? And she said, no, 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 no. we're not hiring, but, two, but, 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 but then she said, but two companies that are always hiring, and she wrote, she physically wrote down the addresses of these two small animation companies. I think it was, you know, her thought was like, oh, this this guy's looking for a job in animation, so let me try to hook him up. Yeah. Um, which again, I, I, I only wish I could have gone back and sort of, uh, you know, hugged her because um, one of the companies uh, was a small company called Deke. And at that time, Deke was doing um, the old cartoon Inspector Gadget. Mm, yeah. And that was the company that I ended up getting my first job at as a production assistant. And that's what sort of built my career in animation. Now, I will rem I remember saying to myself, even with that job, I remember saying, I'll just do this until I get a real entertainment job. And I just, I never left this industry. And so that was my entree into animation. And, you know, there's reasons why I stayed in animation, certainly, um, which we can talk about. But I think that that is how I got my job in animation. And, you know, today it's very different. Trying to get that first job in animation is incredibly competitive. Yeah, you know? wow. And um, so uh, for me, it was... I, I used to say, oh, I, I, I got in, I, it was the, I, I was lucky, I got in, I was lucky, but you know what, you know, I tell this to students, yeah, maybe a little bit, but I put myself in a position to be lucky, is how yeah. I sort of, you know, I went out there, you know, with the thought of, let me try this, you know, let me see what's out there, let me sort of flow on this journey, you know, limited finances, I, I, I mean, I had a certain amount of time that I, could do this before I was going to run out of money. So, you know, it's like it the clock was always ticking. ticking. And, you know, I, I, I was, I, I, I had that sort of safety net of, you know, my mom wasn't in a position yet to say, no, nah, you can't come back. <laughs> so, you know, I was fortunate there, I will say. But, um, you know, I would have a different perspective on that today. For somebody mm. coming out, I would say, you know, especially when you're trying to get in the entertainment industry, what we consider the entertainment industry and based in LA, based in Southern California, um, there's so many different 
ancillary businesses tied to what we consider the entertainment industry, you know, and access to that that you wouldn't have in any place else in this country. Yeah. You know? So I think I would, you know, my, my take then was like, I'm only going to, I'm only going to take an entertainment job. If I don't get that, I'll go back and I'll reconfigure. I would have a different perspective now. I would say, I'm going to get a job out here, uh, yeah. whatever job that is, yeah. um, because that way I still have access to the industry. I still have access to workshops and panels and different things that, um, of an, of an industry that I want to get into that going back to Boston or going to Syracuse or wherever else in the country, yeah. uh, say for maybe New York, which I wasn't really interested in doing at that point. Um, I would have a different take on that. Yeah. Yeah. Today, well, sure. well, do you think it's still, uh, that kind of thing is still important now with the advent of the internet and you're not necessarily, Oh, okay. I don't have to live out in LA to do work. Uh, or, you know, to be in, depending on what your position is, I guess, um, you know, animation or. Well, I, I think it's still important because you still have to prove yourself first before you put yourself in a position where you can just decide I'm going to work in the uh, I'm going to work in Maine. You know, you know, if you are a if if you've made your mark. Yeah. as an artist, as a writer, as a fill in the blank, and you've become indispensable to not only the company you're working for or a specific director or a group or any sort of thing where you can now say, look, you know, I love working with you, but, you know, I would prefer to raise my family over there or, you know, my mom needs my help. I want to go back, and, you yeah. know. Um, you have to be able you have to be able to know that you know the work that you've done and 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 like i said being becoming indispensable to the point where people will will pivot they will change their logistical way of how they work with you yeah, in order yeah. to make sure you're on the team so because I'm mostly talking to students and recognizing that yeah sure we have technology look what we're doing right now this conversation we're yeah. having um, physically, sure, it's possible, but, you know, it's not ideal to work remotely when you're talking about, especially when we're talking about animation, when you're talking about uh, creating crew chemistry and collaboration, you know, yeah. those things that during this pandemic um, have sort of been um, uh, undervalued. Yeah, physically and and. and blessed and grateful we could work from home in animation during this time um but i remember during the early stages of the pandemic there were a lot of articles coming out talking about hey is this the new normal more yeah. efficiency maybe we can cut costs here maybe this is the way people want to work and it was like one of those like whoa 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 slow down <laughs> you know we're two months into this and yeah, yeah we have figured out a way due to the innovation and the due, the, 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 the passion and the due diligence of a lot of wonderful people, um, IT people and operations people, getting people connected, getting software and hardware in the, into the right hands. But yeah. let us not forget, let's not do revisionist history here. At the early days of the pandemic, there wasn't this knowledge of how long this would go. People had that mindset of like, oh, come, we can do this, pull up the bootstraps, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll knock this out, you know, because what, what's it going to be? A couple of months, you know, yeah, we, we, we'll, yeah. we'll just do this. And then something, something different happened. And all of a sudden the emotional and psychological aspect of the isolation and not really being prepared and set up to work in this way. Look, not everybody has extra space that they can put an edit bay in. Yeah, not everybody <laughs> has the ability to, you know, people with kids, people have sort of challenges. And so, um, again, I sort of look at this from the, again, blessed and, and grateful that yeah. Physically, we could do this work for, remotely, but is it ideal? No. And yeah. I think people clamoring to go back um, is a testament to the fact that I don't think human beings in general 
are 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 set up to be so isolated. Yeah, that's but I can true. guarantee you, creative people aren't because you're bringing your everyday experiences into your work as yeah. a writer, as an artist. You know, um, and so I think that's what's important here. So, um, so yeah, you know, I think you have the ability now. There's the capability of working remotely in this business. But a lot of things have to sort of break your way. The type of job you yeah, do, yeah. The, the, the reputation that you've created for yourself as a professional. Uh, again, how, how, how important are you specifically to yeah. the end goal of the project? These yeah. are the type of things that sort of uh, can sort of lay the groundwork to whether or not you need to be, quote unquote, on campus or not. Yeah. So how did the the pandemic and the whole situation that we went through in 2020 specifically impact your what you were doing um, as far as work? I mean, what were the biggest challenges that you faced going through that whole situation? So interestingly enough, um, you know, one of the one of my priorities in terms of my job, in terms of doing uh, talent outreach, whether that's with schools or whether that's with different organizations, um, it was silver, kind of a silver lining for me. On that end, um, I will say that um, the reality is is that. In any given year, I probably would have gotten to six to eight campuses to do mm-hmm. presentations, and that was the thought process in terms of um, in, in terms of how I did my school presentations. Um, with the pandemic, it obviously meant doing this via Zoom, yeah. and you know, there's a you know, <laughs> there's a difference between an hour-long chat with the University of Kentucky from my bedroom <laughs> yeah. versus getting on a plane, <laughs> booking hotels. Yeah. So from from a logistical standpoint, um, I've given close to over, I'm going to say over 70 school presentations wow. during yeah. the pandemic. Whereas if that wouldn't happen, I would have like six to eight. I got to six to eight schools this year. Great. You know, I've hit my, <laughs> I, I've hit my number. So, you know, so for me on that particular side of my job um very it, it worked out better to the point where you know when we go back which is not that far around the corner now um this is how i'll still probably be doing really? school presentations really? it doesn't make sense you know it doesn't make look there's something very unique and nice about you know in-person yeah. presentations like you know I'm, I'm not going to dismiss that but you know i, I feel like i haven't lost a whole lot doing outreach in this way yeah. so um so that's been that's obviously been an upside for me you know the, the biggest challenge is obviously when you're in a position where you're trying to connect people together and bring people to 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 do it virtually it's just not the same yeah. you know there's a you're missing that personal touch and again this is what i was saying about the fact that you know in the process of making animation sure we figured it out we could do it this way yeah but ask any creator who has a show on the air and, and, and if the if the shows that they created pre-pandemic and the ones they created during the pandemic from a from a uh, uh, creative consistency or the the, the 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 higher quality episode uh, you as an audience member may not pick up on it that dramatically, but I can tell you any creator worth his or her salt will tell you, no, that this could have been better. I would have done it like this, yeah. like the recording was different on the, you know. And so so there's that aspect of it as well. It's just like we hold the bar very high in terms of the product that we make. And so we want to make sure that we can vouch for that. Um, so there's that. The other thing is, you know, and this is this is what I sort of say, like, crew chemistry and crew collaboration you can't put into a, a line item budget yeah. you know there's just there's, there's no there's no like dollar amount oftentimes what, what makes a good series great is that crew chemistry that spontaneity that sort of that 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 comes with 
two people sitting down over uh, over lunch and yeah. sort of crafting out a storyboard scene that would you know you know that just came spontaneous because they were uh, having lunch together. Yeah. There's things like that that are really important. Crew crew morale, crew collaboration, and all these things are you know you can't really. From my point, you can't monetize that. So I feel like that's one of those areas that, because it's not black and white and so clear, that you know you can write an article say, hey, it's more efficient to do this. It's 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 better this way. Um, look, we've there's a lot of learnings that we've taken away from this in terms of the viability of yeah. working from home. Yeah. I think we all can agree now. Yeah. I think we can all agree that you do not need to go into the office, office yeah. five days a week, 10 hours, <laughs> you know, let's, let's be honest with that. Yeah, um, that's true. Um, sometimes you would want to, and I think sometimes your family yeah. wants you to go, yeah. but I think, I think, I think the reality is like, I think the learning from this will tell you that there is some great efficiencies being able to work from home. And as we always sort of strive for that work life balance, I yeah. mean, this is one of those things where, I can tell you if you're offering me up this hybrid version of a four days on one day at home or even three and two, I'm, I'm listening. I'm yeah. interested in that yeah. because with preparation and with the knowledge that these two days I'll be working from home, I can be even that much more efficient in terms of that. So I think we've learned that we, we can now do that. But again, part of it is based on the job that you have. And, and part of it is the emotional, psychological, way in which you you know you look at your job and you look yeah. at the people you're working with and interacting with i think that's the key the, the key point here yeah yeah i think you made a great point as far as um as creatives we do tend to <clears throat> work better and uh create better when we have other people around us to bounce ideas off of or uh that close in person uh, type of relationship i'm curious um now you getting into the industry you didn't immediately get into uh diversity and what you're doing now what was your first position when you got that first job what were you doing um so if you're talking about the job as a production assistant it was basically um uh part executive assistant part production assistant for um, over for for the shows that we were producing and as a production assistant you could be asked to do anything I mean it, it went all the way from you know hey go copy these scripts copy these storyboards to uh, again back in the day where there wasn't <laughs> people monitoring like go grab the crew coffee or you know, can you drive and pick up that tape or can you drop that yeah. tape over at NBC? Because, you know, again, we weren't in a digital world, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was one of those things where it was like a production assistant was a glorified gopher who could yeah. do sort of anything. Um, um, so that was really how it started. But in that same process, that's how you learned about animation. Yeah. Like, again, this, you know, for people who didn't go to school as animators or you know you, you don't look where do you learn this stuff you learn it on the job yeah. there's, no, there's no place else to sort of learn that from so i think the reality for me is like i just tried to take everything in what really connected me what made me stay in the animation business was the fact that um i became passionate about the art form mm. you know and what people were doing in the process and the protocols but also the people the people working in animation were always so collaborative. And I always say this about, you know, my experience in working in the animation industry. It's a group of people who take their work very seriously, but it's a group of people who don't take themselves seriously. Yeah. And that's the difference. I mean, and it's not even about because we're doing kids cartoons because I've worked in sort of primetime animation as well. I, you know, it's just about the fact that it's a very collaborative business, which means you have to start really trusting, embracing and liking the people you're working with work because, with. Yeah. Yeah. because they're reliant on you, you're reliant on them. So I think it builds it, 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 it builds in an automatic collaborative mechanism that has to sort of work in a way and then and the only way for that to work is to have that respect and fundamental 
you know, trust in, in, in terms of who you're working with. So those are, the, those are the arenas that sort of kept me into the animation industry, no matter what job I was doing, no matter what studio I was at. So, um, and so as I sort of moved up um, in, in terms of um, uh, the, t the type of jobs I had, um, when I when I got to Disney, I was hired at Disney to be more into the development. It was trying to find the next hit show for Disney. Mm -hmm. um, and after a certain amount of time, I moved over to Current Series. It was about four years ago that you know I expanded my role into some of the diversity and inclusion work, and and not from the standpoint. Typically, you would find a lot of your diversity and inclusion work coming from an HR, yeah. you know, yeah. division. It was very important for me to keep my keep my one foot in the creative side while I was going to do this DEI work because I felt like one of my priorities with this was talent outreach, finding that up and coming talent, whether it's a writer, whether it's an artist, whether it's a, a show creator or a production person. It was important to be able to talk to that person from a very direct sort of like, no, 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 I understand. I, I, I understand your concern. I'm in these writer rooms. That's why I know that we need more diversity in our writers' room. It's not an it's not HR speak, you know. Yeah. yeah. And let me say, as I'm talking about that, I, I have great respect for the HR people who work in this space and work with me. I can't do what they do. This isn't this this isn't even just about oh, I can do that, but I don't want to do it. It's like I don't do what they do yeah. from that standpoint. So. Um, and they don't do what I do. So, I, you know, I, I think my whole point here is like, it was important for me to be able to keep my pulse on the creative comings and goings um, so that I am better informed to have the conversation with the writers, with the artists who, who are trying to get into our company. Um, so I'm coming from a position of knowledge and not just guesswork, yeah. you know? So yeah. I think that that's another reason why it was important to me. And Truth be told, I mean, keeping my creative juices flowing is is just important. That's my, that's what I most enjoy. Yeah. You know, I love bringing new talent into the mix, but ultimately, the talent has still got to be great talent, right? Yeah. And they're going to be gonna create great things, and that's where I really like to sort of play in that sandbox of you know watching a show come to life, watching a sequence sort of you know. Um, be better because we've all collaborated together to help it become better is yeah. is the joy of the job. Gotcha, gotcha. So when you go into uh, these uh, universities and uh, places and you're speaking on diversity, what's the point and or and or the message that you're most conveying to the people that you're talking to? Well, so, so it depends on the audience. I mean, I do school outreach and sometimes it's a group of writers. Sometimes it's a mix of communication students. Sometimes it's just various students. And so it's really, first of all, letting the students dictate where the conversation goes. I mean, when I give a presentation, it's less presentation and more conversation. Yeah. I don't have a PowerPoint or a keynote deck that I am sort of <laughs> going through. It's just like, Okay, folks, I'm here for an hour. Hit me up. Here's what I do. Here's the here's the division I work in. I know when you hear the name Disney, you want to sort of ask me about the parks and the Marvels and the end game and like which is fine. You know, we can have that conversation too. Uh, but I think for me, one of the reasons I do the reach the school outreach the way I do is because I'm not really recruiting. You know, it's like I'm not coming to the school saying I have 10 open jobs. Yeah, so you guys need no. to get your, you know, I'm, I'm coming to provide information. I'm, and, and, and more often than not, it's people specifically trying to get into the animation side of the business. Yeah. Not always, you know, some, you know, there's some that, you know, I want to get into PR. I want to get into marketing. I, I, you know, because we, because we are connected to that world in terms of what we do, I can, you know, share information on that. But, you know, I think if I had to pick out one particular group that is my focus, it would be writers because writers have always been, um, we've always had an art and animation recruitment team that has gone to the, 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 the Cal arts and the school of visual yeah. arts and Ringling and Savannah, um, because we need a lot of artists. We do a lot of shows, 
writers had always been sort of left to, well, call up the agents, call up the agencies and see what they, see what they have, which, you know, still has value to it. But ultimately, if we are trying to sort of break the model of not having diverse writers room, then you have to find those writers elsewhere. You have to train them. You have to go outside of your box to find out where, you know, where this talent lies. And so, you know, one of the most obvious aspects of that are schools, obviously, but not even limited to schools. I mean, I sort of look at, it's part of the reason I do a lot of panels and I go to a lot of workshops and, and, and different places so that people know that I'm there who, who can approach me. Um, um, not everybody can afford to go to school, right? Yeah, and, and not true. everybody is set up for that. So I need to make myself available to as many people as possible in terms of the search for talent. And so, look, talent is just not in LA and New York, right? It's yeah, everywhere. No, it's yeah, everywhere. You have to go find yeah. it. Otherwise, yeah. you just sort of get limited to yeah. just, oh, we'll just take the person who lives down the street. Well, yeah. you know, <clears throat> let's, let's, let's do better. Yeah, yeah. So do you feel like that's uh, one of the uh, major things that most studios should be doing if they're really wanting to make a diverse uh, um, atmosphere, I guess, is doing that outreach and really taking the time to find uh, these this talent that's out there and not necessarily the talent that's down the street or the talent that, Oh, this is my cousin or this is my friend type of thing. Yeah. Well, I look, I, to, to be frank, I mean, I think a lot of the students have been doing this for a while on different levels, maybe not to the degree that they probably should have been, but I will say that, um, you know, I have a lot of wonderful colleagues who work in at other studios who have incredibly great programs. There's been writing programs, the Nickelodeon writing program. You know, we have our own apprentice writing program. We have we have a um, our ABC uh, writer and director programs. Um, so there are a lot of programs out there for this. I think you know, it's your approach to how committed and intentional you are to wanting to make sure that um, your crews are as diverse as the audience who you're serving, right? You know, and I think, you know, for me, and especially um, for what we do at Disney, that 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 is paramount. So um, I am very fortunate that I was put into a position where I could, um, you know, do that work, do that outreach work, and still, um, still do my creative job. So that shows to me commitment and intent. So I think I think certainly from last summer's social unrest, there's been a whole lot of additional programs put into place, whether it's mentorship, internships and what have you, because I think there is a real want in I can look, I can only speak for my my neck of the woods. There's a real sincere want to um to change, to get more people involved, to be more I I inclusive. Yeah. And so with that sincere want, it makes it very easy for me to go out and have these conversations and, he and even to be um, in situations like this where we're having these interviews, yeah. to be able to sort of say truthfully, like, yeah, we are, we're, we're, making, we're making a difference. Is there still a lot of work to do? Absolutely, yeah. you know, and because there's no playbook for this work, no. you know, there's, there's really no playbook for this work. So. You know, again, I feel like I'm in a fortunate position where I've been given the the opportunity to um, connect up with students and up and, and and this talent, and 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 um and and with that responsibility comes the idea of being accessible. So it's part of the reason why, you know, um, my my social media of choice is LinkedIn, um, yeah. and. As you might imagine, I get a lot of people reaching out to me. I try to, for those who are looking to get get advice or get a half hour, I do my best to try to hit everyone. It takes a long time, as you know, talking even about how long it took me to get you, but yeah. you know, my heart is pure with it. My heart is pure with it. It I, took I, me a I, while, people. We yeah. went back but and you, forth. <laughs> but, but, but you kept at it. And that's, I guess, the advice we should give students out there. Yeah. Keep at it. Yeah, know? yeah. But I think that comes with the territory. And I don't think I would be doing my job properly if I wasn't sort of 
um, uh, meeting talent where they are, you know, and you never know where you're going to find talent. So I'm not going to assume, I, I can't assume that, oh, this is just somebody else who's just trying to get, in. you know, you get a lot of people who don't understand the level of quality that you need as an artist to become, to work at Disney or as a writer. Um, that's okay. You know, I mean, Disney is an incredibly competitive place and I'm always going to tell people, I'm, I'm going to tell them truthfully that yeah. it is tough. But here's some other things to consider, advice I can give you. You know, I, I, I always try to sort of flip it around to say, okay, well, understand that as long as you understand that there's a competitive nature to this, here's what I will try to arm you with in order to compete in yeah. that world. And then, you know, then it, again, it comes down to your talent. You know, ultimately, my, a big part of my job is to get you into the party. Yeah. But then it's up to you, you to, to find a person to dance with and, <laughs> and you know, do your thing. So um, I think that's really the focus. I Look, I don't do any hiring. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I don't hire writers. I don't hire artists. I bring these creative folks to our teams who so that they can compete with others in terms of accessing some of these jobs. Yeah, yeah. And, do, and, and along that point, do you also think that it's going to take – uh, getting uh, people of color and diverse backgrounds in more executive, like role, well, you know, roles as such as yourself that do have uh, the ability to make those uh, more critical decisions in who they bring in. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's another part of the layer as well. I mean, I think that, you know, we all have to be honest about. Uh, what senior leadership, not just in the entertainment, not, not just in the entertainment industry, but, you know, in corporate, in oh, yeah. academia, what, you know, so it's, it's certainly not a, uh, it, it's certainly not an entertainment industry issue, but in, in that, that's the, the, the arena in which I'm working in. Yeah. I mean, that's where we have these new mentorship programs and, and, and talent planning uh, programs so that people can start to look through a different lens yeah. as we're sort of trying to figure out who to who who to promote and who to bring into these positions now and 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 open up a wider scope in, in terms of um, the talent that oftentimes is already in your midst yeah. you know um, and just haven't been given an opportunity so i think that's where a lot of the focus shift for me last summer with the social unrest and the George Floyd murder is just like I had been doing my focus had been talent outreach and you know and I continue to do that but now it became like let's talk about the people who are already here and what yeah. their career path is and what their growth is and 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 figure out how we need to do better in that sense and so I think that's that's really what um, uh, that has that was changed for me a little bit from last summer. Yeah. You know, the pandemic and the political climate and a lot of different things that were happening just, you know, played havoc on a whole lot of different things. Yeah. And I think, you know, just trying to sort of see the different layers of it, you know, and someone in my position has always been challenging. But, um, you know, we just you just try to control what you can control. You know, you can't save the world. Yeah. So in my little sandbox at TVA, what can I do to help? And yeah. that's what I've sort of focused on. And, and you know, look, if everybody had that same sensibility, right? Like, hey, just deal with the world that you're in right there yeah. and make that a better make place. A if everyone did that, yeah. then... Yeah, you know, it, it would exponentially sense. grow. Yes. Exponentially grow. Um, Absolutely. To this point, and, and we kind of talked about it when we first connected. Do you think it's harder for companies like Disney and Warner that have been around for decades, 60 plus years, to make that shift of because they have been doing things a certain way for so long? Um, to make that shift to, and turn towards more diversity? Do you think it's harder for those companies that have been around for, for decades and decades? As you know, what, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and again, I don't know that I have a, 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 
don't know that I have an answer on that necessarily, other than to say that, you know, when in any sort of situation where we have just decided collectively that, you know what, we're going to, this is, we're, for this position, we are going to hire this, we want this type of person to come in and we need to, we need to find that person. And we need to look for that person for as long as it takes. So we need to make adjustments while we're looking and it might take longer than usual. And we all have to be aligned on this, whether it means um, budgets need to be extended or schedules need to be extended. Um, so I guess the best way to answer that would be, um, I don't think it's any harder or easier for any company. I think it, it, it comes down to uh, the people who make up the company being intentional about changing it. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I'd venture to say it could be harder at a small company if, you yeah, know, if they're set. you know, if two people are the ones <laughs> who are sort of drive, right? Versus yeah, a yeah. company the size of Disney or Warner Brothers. So, um, but then I, I get what you're saying in terms of this sort of embedded sort of like, we've been doing it this way for so long. So it's hard to change type of thing where, you might look at a smaller company as being able to pivot quicker. I think it just, again, it really depends on, that's why I sort of go back to the intentionality and the commitment yeah. that that people who make up these companies, like, yeah, these companies are not just like, like it's people working within these companies who have to decide um, collectively that this is what we need to do. It's the right thing to do. And this is what we want. This is the values that we have. This is how we want to represent ourselves. Um, and so that is what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I like to say that this is such a great time, I feel, for content creators because you've got so many different avenues that you can go down, whether it's YouTube, um, you know, Instagram, Twitter. How does, how does that kind of, um, what's the word, uh, I want to say time kind of fit in with, with Disney and, and animation as it goes, because now necessarily I don't have to, as a filmmaker or as a uh, animator, if I have an idea, I don't necessarily have to go the Disney route. I can build a, a bigger, just as big a following depending on, whether your content is good enough on YouTube and monetize it and, and do sure. that. So how does that play out and balance with the studios now? Um, because I'm pretty sure a majority of studios are scouring the internet, just like we're looking at content on the internet. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, any development executive, you know, <laughs> worth his weight is going to be all over. Like the perfect example is TikTok. I mean, yeah. I, I can tell you, I'm not on TikTok. I, I'm not, that's not my thing. But If you see Jay uh, on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, no. But, you know, I see enough content coming out of there, whether it's on YouTube or whether to know, yeah. like, there are incredibly creative people yeah. who are doing things with, with that, right? And so, you know, as, you, as, as sort of your responsibility as a development executive to not only find new talent, but new show ideas, if you're not on Instagram, if you're not looking at it, <laughs> yeah. you're, just, you're just not doing your job, in my, in my opinion. Um, you know, that being said, you know, there is still that sort of traditional mindset of there's the, you know, there's the distributors and there's the people who have the pipeline in terms yeah. of to create a bigger process or marketing teams and whatnot. Um, but I will say, you know, as an as a person who's tried his company, his own company, a couple of times, and at at the time thought I failed, um, just because look, if I was successful, I'd still have him, right? Um, but I think that, you know, back in those days when you only had one way to pitch something, you had yeah. to bring, you had to get a pitch meeting with somebody at Disney or Warner Brothers. Now you you know the creator has also become the distributor. The cre and, and this is not something recent, obviously, even from the standpoint of like look at the music industry yeah. and how that changed when yeah. you but basically as a creator, you're not purely beholden to 
these large corporations because you can promote yourself, you can market yourself. You now can, you know, there was a day when like, you couldn't create your own animation, yeah. you know, because you didn't have the technology to do that. So yeah. and, now you got a lot I'm, of free software that's just as good yeah. and you see some awesome so, things coming out. Um, the dynamic has certainly changed and it's, and you know, but again, I still think it's that idea of the cream rises to the top. I mean, there's a, so there's a lot of people making films because you can do that, right? Yeah. Um, how many of them are good? Yeah. You know, how many true. of them are relevant? How many of them sort of strike a chord uh, with an audience, even a grassroots level audience? So, you know, I think ultimately you're still talking about quality of talent. Uh, you're still talking about creators with a very strong, uh, relevant point of view that resonates with a certain audience. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a talent and a skill that, that um, some people are born with, I think, and some people develop over time. But ultimately, I think that um, um, for those talent, for those who are talented enough, they certainly have more leverage than they had before. Oh, yeah. Because if you can come to the table with, you know, as a, as a YouTuber, who's who has a following of X amount of people, like, you know, um, it would be good to 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 have a collaboration with Warner Brothers or Disney yeah, or whoever yeah. else, but you don't necessarily need it. Yeah, it yeah. would be good to have, but you don't need it in order to succeed. And I think that to me is the difference here in, in terms of what you know today's entertainment industry looks like. But I don't think it it changes the fact that you know the major players in this industry still you know. Um, you know, I think sort of referencing Marvel movies, for example, yeah. it's like, you know, those are big events, you know, yeah. that, you, you know, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's wanting to find the new talent that can take that to the next generation or the next level. Right. Yeah. So, um, so th I, I think that's the way to sort of look at that yeah. from, from that yeah. perspective. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of which, Obviously, uh, streaming has a streaming service has become really big with a lot of studios. Disney's got a streaming channel, you know, Netflix is streaming. All these studios are streaming. Have you looked what, to, in your opinion, have you looked past that or what's the next thing going forward from that? from your perspective or? You know, there's a lot of technology that's still sort of being innovated and developed. You know, a, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, virtual v VR, virtual reality and stuff like that. Um, you know, personally, um, I have always been of the mind that the, dis the, the way content is distributed is, has never been my skill set or necessarily, I've had interest in it, but for me, it's always been about the story. It's yeah. always been about what the type of stories we're telling. So how how stories are sold or distributed or whatnot, I really don't give a whole lot of thought to that. Um, I think in part of your job, you have to have an awareness of it because it impacts schedules and budgets and what have you. But, you know, it was the same. So it, to me, it was almost like the same type of debate: two D versus three D. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about animated, like, you know, we could sort of debate that all all day long. But ultimately, it still has to be a great story. Yeah, and if yeah. it's a great story, then then it's going to resonate. And regardless, um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I can look at, you know, when I sort of talk about some of my favorite. Disney movies like or like Lilo and Stitch is still one of the top of my you know and that's really? a small and it's a <laughs> small little yeah, film. Yeah. the story was so resonated with me so much one of the um, movies in the past um, that I always felt like never got its just desserts was The Iron Giant oh um, yeah yeah and yeah. And, and and I don't think you know <clears throat> yeah I, I don't think. <clears throat> it would have been any, I don't think it would have had any more sort of flight of fancy if it was a CG movie, you know, no, it's like, it's no. the story is the story. And I think that for, for me, that's, that's sort of fundamentally where I've always sort of focused in on, 
because I recognize that technology is always going to change. Distribution yeah. platforms are always going to change. You know, we no one was thinking about streaming. Yeah. You know, yeah, and that's what yeah. I love. Uh, that's one of the big things I loved about, or uh, and still love about Pixar. Everything came back to story. Didn't really matter what it was or what new tech not, what new technique they were trying to do or anything like that. They always went back to what's the essence of the story and is this a great story to tell? And I think even now that you're seeing a mix of 2D and 3D animations mixed together, you know, live action of I've seen just sketch drawings that are beautifully animated, but the story behind it is what really made it. And I think, like you were saying to your point, it always comes back to story and sure. what's being told. You know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, like I said, we've had a good uh, uh, conversation. Like I said, I... I always respectful of my guest time and I don't want to keep you on here uh, forever. Uh, but two final questions. And one, I think you kind of, you, you kind of answered it a little bit before, but I'm going to ask it again. You've been in this industry uh, 14 plus years. What is it that still excites you about what you do in this industry as a whole? that keeps you coming back day after day, year after year in doing it? Well, you're being very kind to me and saying I've, all, I've been in it just for 14 years. <laughs> that's just been, that's Disney. So, uh, okay. um, oh. um, it's the same, you know, the answer to that's the same reason that I stayed in animation. Um, it was just the, um, just the embracing of how a project comes together, you know, and, 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 you know, seeing it on paper and seeing it up on the screen, it, it, there's still that jolt of like, you know, could bring a tear to your eye, you know, cause you, you, you saw it that way a little bit, but you didn't see it that way, but it all came together. So there's that. And look, I just be honest, the people, I mean, I, 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 I can't tell you that, you, you know, how important it is that even with the group I work with now in current series, for example, we've been sort of the same team for almost 10 years now. And that to me is telling. And I think that, you know, going into a going into a job where you automatically know the people are going to be empathetic to you know, if your show is the problem show today, you know, we've all been there, right? So having that support, I think is really key. So that's what keeps me going. I mean, I, and now I have the added sort of layer of um, being in a position to bring new people into the fold, which is, you know, is like a sort of double down on, you know, perhaps the one thing that I was missing from my, my days as a recruiter is like being able to facilitate, um, um, getting people internships and jobs and their first opportunity is great. So those are the things that certainly sort of get me out of bed each morning in terms gotcha. of what I look forward to in this business. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, two, two more quick questions. What, what, what's been the best piece of advice that you've gotten over the span of your career that, that every now and again, you come back to. Um, Great question. Uh, I think it sort of fundamentally falls into the uh, the reason why I actually started my comp started a couple of companies. Um, I didn't start that with the idea of like, oh, I want to be rich and famous, or I want to control my own destiny. I mean, maybe there's a little aspect of everything you do with that, but it really came down to. Um, I didn't want to have to wake up one day at 80 years old and say, what if, like, what if I tried my own company? What if I had done this? You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to have that regret ever in my career. Yeah. So I guess the, you know, the advice I sort of circled back to is almost the advice that I gave to myself to a certain degree. It's just like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have any regrets in terms of what I've done in my career. So, 
if there is that risk that you need to take, you sort of need to take it because you don't want to regret you don't want to regret it. And with the understanding that with that can come consequences and failure, but that's also the, the learning aspect of it as well. So um, that's what I keep coming back to. Gotcha, gotcha. Which kind of answers the the last question I always kind of like ending on. Um, and it could kind of play into it. Uh, but the question is, not that you would change anything, but if you could go back in time and be standing in front of your younger self, what would you tell your younger self? Um, well, one thing I've always said about being in school is, you know, when you get to college, introduce yourself and become friends with your career services person immediately. <laughs> do not wait until you're a senior or, do, or, or or never visit at all, even if you leave. You pay a lot of good money for those services as well. So um, and there'll be one day where you will want to be friends with those career services people. But, you know, I don't, you know, I feel like I have... I guess what I would say to my younger self was to be a little bit more proactive and aggressive in terms of going after some of the, maybe some other types of jobs. Again, within the animation, I was never looking to get out of it, that, that I sort of like didn't think I was ready for or didn't have enough knowledge on. It's just, it, it's that idea of like, if you look at how my career has progressed, it's been basically, um, just figuring it out to a certain degree, figuring it out as I go and then attaching myself to, oh, that's interesting to me. Let me follow that path. I wish I had done that faster. I wish I had done that sooner. Um, you know, maybe I would have had different experiences because I would give my, you know, the, 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 the not, not staying so stagnant and getting so comfortable in one position that you, that you forget to sort of look in other areas is probably what I would tell my younger self. Got you, got you. <clears throat> well, Jay, this has been uh, such a great conversation. And like I said, well worth the uh, time and uh, wait getting you on for sure. And definitely look forward to having you back on um, to talk more about what you're doing at the moment, what Dis if you're still at Disney, what what's going on with Disney and everything else. Like I said, I appreciate you so, so much for uh, becoming a part of the Color of Motion family. Uh, like I said, I know I've been wanting to get you on for, for quite a while, um, and I thank hey, you for that. Hey, John, the, the, the pleasure's mine. Glad you hung in there. Glad we got this done. And uh, notwithstanding our technical difficulties at the beginning, I hope people enjoyed enjoyed that. So, definitely, um, definitely. Um, ha happy to come back. I appreciate that. Everybody, like I said, make sure that uh, you connect with Jay. Like I said, he is on his platform of choice is LinkedIn, which is how I connected with him. Uh, so make sure that you reach out, connect with him. He puts great content up, um, always giving back to, to, to the community and uh, giving out great information for sure. Again, all this will be in the show notes. Uh, make sure that you jump on to uh, my YouTube channel and uh, get all of that. Uh, again, Jay, thank you so, so much for taking uh, this time out. And I so look forward to having you back on the show. Appreciate it, Don. Take care, everyone. Everybody, give him a great hand, and we will see him next time. Take care. Thank you. All right. Wow, that was such a great show. And I want to thank again my guest, Mr. Jay Francis, for being a part of the Color of Motion family. He always brings such great information, had such a great time. Make sure that you tune in next week because it's going to be another great show with my guest and friend, Mr. Robert Jonathan, voice actor for video games and animation, the animation voice. 
uh, I think he's going to be the first guest that I've had on that's a voice actor. So I'm really looking forward to having him on the show and sitting down and chopping it up with him. Again, make sure you hop on over to my YouTube page, subscribe, give a thumbs up. Better yet, comment, because that always helps the channel. Um, and hit the bell notification so that uh, you get notified of when the shows go live or when and when great new content goes up on the channel. So with that, I'm going to close out the show. Look forward to seeing you next week. And everybody, have a great week. Cheers.